Cambridge Orthopaedics, Pelvic Fractures Part 1, Introduction and Classification. Welcome to Cambridge Orthopaedics. Uh, my name is Jay Rowell. I'm a trauma surgeon at Adam Brooks Hospital, Cambridge University in the UK. And this is going to be a series of talks because I've realised it's far too much to pack into one. Otherwise, you'll all be falling asleep at the end. Um, but we're going to talk a bit about pelvic fractures and we'll see how far we get. All right. Well, pelvic fractures have been around for a very long time, probably for as long as Homo sapiens has been bipedal and probably before then as well. Um, huge morbidity, okay, with pelvic fractures. Huge morbidity back in history, huge morbidity back now. Um, when you've got an unstable fracture, they don't do well at all in terms of function, in terms of long-term outcomes, etc. And this is a drawing done by uh, Charles Moore in the 19th century, uh, really, really illustrating how much deformity can occur in the pelvic ring from a pelvic fracture. So pretty significant indeed. And we know the high energy injuries, right? You know, this is, this is proper energy going through a body to break one of the hardest, biggest bones in it, right? Road traffic accidents. Horses, they provide a lot of trauma for us. Uh, people falling from horses, the horse rolls on top of them. Just anything to do with a horse is pretty bad news, if, uh, if I'm honest. Although they are lovely, magnificent, wonderful animals. And motorbikes, yeah, great. Uh, a horse is heavy, rolls on you, it hurts. A motorbike goes really fast. I mean, it's the other end of that equation, half mv squared. It goes super fast, people come off them at speed. Big deceleration injuries um, and big trauma. That's the dog, by the way. He's just sat down there being annoying. Um, no, so we, we know high energy is really a, a big instigator of pelvic ring injuries. But you know what? In the older age group, you still get the same high energy injuries. People still participating in horse riding, still participating in driving. Um, of course, and, and accidents happen, and so unfortunately, high energy imparts through a frailer, uh, less hard bone, less hard substance, and causes quite significant damage as well. Now, we're not going to touch on insufficiency fractures on this set of the, of, of the lectures and talks, um, but insufficiency fractures around the pelvic ring, uh, they're their own beast, and they're such a, they create quite a lot of work for us now. Um, and quite a, re a few reasonably good studies coming out, uh, some very good randomized control studies looking at insufficiency fractures in the elderly, particularly. Um, the outcomes of pelvic ring fractures are worse with the severity that goes through, right? So a, a highly unstable fracture has poor outcomes. And it has poor outcomes because of a head injury, because of the spine injury, because of the chest, abdominal, and extremity outcomes as well. Now, more energy imparted, greater blood loss, more transfusion requirements. Um, so pelvic injuries are a big deal. Outcomes are poor. And pelvic ring stability, this is really important, isn't it? Because the pelvis does not make sense. It is an inherently unstable structure until you add in a whole load of ligaments to help bind it together and keep it tight. Um, it's like a Roman arch with the keystone turned upside down, that being the sacred. Uh, or another analogy, of course, is, is a suspension bridge. What we have are a series of ligaments. We've got the sacro tuberous, sacro spinous, pubic symphysis at the front, and the, one, the ones we like to look at now, the, the anterior sacroiliac ligament and the posterior sacroiliac ligament, and the iliolumbar ligament from the transverse process of the lumbar spine to the back of the sacrum. And those are important in terms of internal stability as well. When we're looking at a pelvis for stability, we're, we're assessing it both clinically, um, radiologically, and sometimes in theatre to try and assess how that patient behaves under load. Okay. Stability tells us, to a degree, uh, amongst other factors, but stability tells us, does this pelvis need fixation or would it benefit from fixation and to help us in that journey um, Marvin Tile, Sunnybrook Canada um, published a seminal work on uh, the tile classification um, saying that type A's are stable, B's rotationally unstable, V 
vertically stable and C is rotationally and vertically unstable. What does that mean? Okay, well, let's go through it. So stable A1s, those are like avulsion fractures. Oh, we've got a pelvis here. Avulsion fractures, ischium. Hamstrings pull off a little bit of bone or an avulsion fracture or push off fracture of the iliac crest. But the integrity of the ring is all intact. A2s, okay, so the integrity of the ring has been a bit compromised, but there's enough stability um, around that for it to function and work. Type B's, rotationally unstable. So hang on a minute. I think this is where if we've got our pelvis, it's either externally rotated out, so a forced abduction injury to the leg. I'm gonna stand up, hang on a sec. Leg goes bang out to the side. And a bad view of my bedroom there. Um, Cause an external rotation moment on, 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 on the pelvis. And, and then you get at rotational deformity, or indeed, let's imagine an internal rotation movement of the pelvis, um, and that internal rotation movement uh, causing a compression type fracture. Now, uh, we've got a picture of this a little bit later on, but there's the B3, the lateral compression contralateral. Right, my goodness, that's a mouthful. Um, here, and there's a picture coming, so. Forgive me if I don't explain it well. We've got an injury on one side, and cleverly, before the pelvis disappears because of virtual backgrounds, an injury on the contralateral side. Hence, this whole segment has a big lever arm and can move a long way. Bucket handle deformity. It is unstable, and the problem with those is fixing them and compressing them at the back can increase the deformity, and it looks rather ugly. Uh, probably doesn't function so well either. Rotationally and vertically stable. Mm. Okay, so here we've got a pelvis that you can put anywhere on the X, Y, Z coordinate, or Z if you're in America, uh, in relation to the other side. Okay. Now C3 is associated with mass tabular fracture. This is where the whole there's been an explosion um, in that pelvic ring. Have to be sensitive there because actually explosive device and IEDs cause a forced abduction to both sides and a perineal injury. Um, so uh, those are certainly a phenomena that we're seeing more from all time in the modern decades. It's an example of that bucket handle deformity, contralateral. Right, uh, bring up the mouse, and you can see here injury to this sacroiliac joint, and interestingly, an injury to the other side at the anterior structures. Where I found this to be a problem is not if it's an injury at the sacroiliac joint, but more if it's a comminuted fracture of the alar, and a comminution means that there isn't a hard bone-on-bone -bone end stop. For example, sacroiliac joint reduction, you can reduce it so far, it's hard to reduce it any further. But if there's comminution, it can keep going, keep going, keep going, and create increasing deformity. Forgive the dog again, he's bored. Okay, vertical, vertical instability. Right. We've already addressed this a little bit earlier on, but um, where are you, mouse? Mouse has disappeared. There you are. Um, here we can see this alar fracture that's contributing to the vertical stability. And what you notice from this is actually how hard it is to get from an anterior approach to that sacral fracture at the back. It is difficult because of all the gubbins, all the nerve roots, all the, all the issues that you get right in the back in that corner. So it's much easier to approach from either posteriorly or indirect reductions. Vertical is an interesting thing. We always assume that the pelvis has gone up. So if we're looking at it on an outlet view, there we are, camera. Let's turn myself up. Looking on an outlet view, we expect one side of the pelvis to have gone superiorly. Actually, often, if we rotate round to an inlet view now, yay, it's, that it's gone posteriorly. It's gone posteriorly um, in its direction. So often it's a combination of both, superior and posterior. Uh, another graphic demonstration coming up, which means when the leg, <laughs> my leg doesn't show up, when the leg's on traction, it's been pulled in that direction. And that often reduces both. Um, it's so entertaining doing this on Zoom. 
Now we've gone from tile classification, which is very, very useful, um, and I don't imply that one is better than the other, um, to the Young and Burgess classification, which is more mechanistic. Okay, so this tells you which direction the force has gone, which makes logical sense to my brain, where I like to think, what's the mechanism that's caused this injury? So lateral compression type one, force from the side. Okay, and that creates an alar fracture, um, alar fracture right along there, right along the alar. Okay, and that can be a Denny zone one, two, or three. Uh, we got a lateral compression type two, which creates a different force, still from compression, but instead of the alar breaking, it's broken outside on the crescent. Okay, um, outside the SI joint. Sometimes it goes into it, um, but it leaves behind a crescent, a constant bit of um, pelvis attached to the sacroiliac joint, so a crescent of bone behind. Now the reason why this is unstable in my mind is because if you look at the back and the supporting structures of an alar fracture, they're all here, right? The, uh, those, that density of ligamentous structures at the back holding everything together. Now, if you've got a fracture that comes outside of that, it isn't supported by ligamentous structures and therefore I think conceptually is more unstable. That hand there, an LC3 fracture. This is pretty easy as well because if you have a fracture on one side, okay, or an, an, uh, an injury on one side, you're looking for a contralateral injury. So often this is because of a rollover mechanism where there's been both an internal force to one side of the hemipelvis and a corresponding external rotational force to the other side. So the internal lateral compression side, external AP side, and often that's at the SI joint, and so you've got the sacral halar fracture or a crescent fracture on one side and an opening of the SI joint on the other. And hang on a minute, the patient often comes in nowadays to our emergency departments in a binder and they're placed on a scoop which nicely holds the pelvis back together again and it looks just like an electrical compression type injury, electrical compression type 1, um, but it isn't, but it isn't, it's uh, electrical compression type 3, hiding itself, masquerading. Okay. Now, we can talk about the anterior posterior compression injuries. They, they make sense. Force from the front, that's an AP direction force, springs the, uh, the pubic symphysis open a little bit and has a variation of degree of injury to the posterior structures. So an APC2, widened diastasis, greater than two and a half centimeters, anterior sacroiliac joint ligament. So it's opened up and a bit like this, there's a hinge at the back. It's opened up and part of the reduction maneuver is closing it around that hinge. So actually you get really nice reductions. However, an APC3 is where you no longer have a hinge. It's broken at the back of the posterior ligaments as well, and therefore this pelvis is deeply unstable. Vertical shear, we've already talked about, either superior or posterior or combination in its direction. Later on in these talks, we'll talk about other um, fracture patterns as well, which have relevance, um, so spinal pelvic dissociation, etc. Stability is one of the key points that we are trying to find to determine our justification for fixation. Okay, and that stability um, takes various forms, be it how much pain the patient is in, how much pain they are when they move, roll or turn in bed. Are they able to functionally weight bear or not functionally weight bear? What's the energy that's gone through this pelvic system? Are there other associated injuries and what's their rehabilitation potential? But also comes down to the clinical, the radiographic findings in addition. And the radiographic findings are um, often debatable, but for example, that iliolumbar ligament injury suggesting a posterior ligamentous complex injury or um, basically harbingered by or marked by that L5 transverse process avulsion fracture. So that's an indicator of instability. The complete LC1 going from the front of the sacrum, from the front of the sacrum on the CT scan to the back of the sacrum. And you can see it in its continuity, either on the axial 
and on the corona. The indicators of stability. Also, the amount of deformity it's in when you know it comes in in the binder and in the scoop, and if it looks really compressed up, suggests that you know it doesn't take a lot of force to compress that pelvis into an abnormal position. Vertical shears. The fracture pattern indicates instability. So we know that. LC2s are unstable. We know that LC3s are very unstable. We know that APC2s are unstable. We know that APC3s are very unstable. Or we know that vertical shears are unstable. We know that spinal pelvic dissociation is unstable. It sounds unstable. Okay, so number one, clinical. Number two, radiographic indications. Number three, fracture pattern. And number four is our EUA. This is an example of that bucket handle type deformity involving the sacral ala rather than the SI joint. And you can see uh, you can see the fracture here at the back on this inlet view and the contralateral injury on the rhema parasympathial. And this goes in this is fluoroscopy, this is interoperative fluoroscopy. All cases seen in these are uh, cases uh, of my cases. Uh, don't want to sound arrogant. Uh, compression applied, a lot of deformity, a lot of deformity, unstable. There's a bigger question here. Does that then mean it needs fixing? Uh, does it then need stabilization? Or are we assuming that this is the normal resting position of the patient when they're getting up, they're mobilizing? Um, probably not when they're lying on their side. It's important to get good imaging, and I'll digress a little bit, but it's important to get good imaging, right? And I was taught this by some amazing trainers. Um, and on the inlet view, I'm looking for this hard cortical density of S1 overlying S2. And that gives you a hard density, which tells me where the front of the pelvis is. And very accurately, and often you can see whether there's a recess in a dysmorphic pelvis or not. But this is a really important sort of indication. Um, that I've got a good image. When I get to other views, we'll demonstrate that more clearly.